All right. Welcome everyone to this uh, open lecture on AI and machine learning. My name is uh, Stefan Forsström and I am an um, assistant professor at Mids Vinnie University in computer engineering. And uh, this open lecture will be about language, uh, intelligence and thinking machines by Patrick Couch. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them using our multi uh, Mentimeter using the code 8339. 0834 and you can see it here also on the screen and you can put in questions during the the, um, the presentation and we will take all of them uh, in the end all right so uh, with that again welcome everyone to, to to this open lecture and i think i will hand it over to you patrick all right uh, thank you very much i'm uh, i'm happy to be here today uh, to talk about uh, the possibilities and challenges with artificial intelligence uh, i will be covering quite a bit of ground over the upcoming 40 45 minutes or so uh, and basically this is the this is the topics that I will touch upon. I will talk about how I view our current times uh, as a digital first kind of world. Uh, I will try and answer some of the questions uh, listed here. What is artificial intelligence? What can artificial intelligence do? What is intelligence? How did it evolve? How does technology make us human? How human is our technology? the human condition, the energy cost of intelligence, and then I'll try and wrap up with the forward escape. So my aim with this presentation is to inspire you, make you curious, uh, allow you to think, uh, and really try to contextualize this very interesting field that is uh, artificial intelligence. All right, so with that said, let's dig into this. For, for a long time now, I have been uh, sort of thinking about our times as a digital first world. And it wasn't until just recently that I came across a very interesting concept or word uh, that I found super useful. And it is this word, algocracy, which is basically ruled by algorithm. So if you think of democracy being ruled by the people, Algocracy is where you have algorithms calling the shots or executing uh, decisions. And I am very fond of uh, talking about artificial intelligence and I find it very important to do so. And I'm very happy to do so in, uh, at universities, in schools at, at all levels, because I think it is super important for us uh, as, as citizens, as, uh, as people living today, to, to be a little bit aware of some of the challenges associated with, with our technologies and how they are being uh, worked out now. So therefore, I think this, the notion of algocracy is a very, very interesting one. And the other day, a, uh, a former colleague of mine, Dr. Ola Laudi, we were at IBM together, uh, and um, he is now at a company called Causality Link. He received the other day an email from LinkedIn claiming that uh, he was not the man on the picture. And thus, uh, LinkedIn decided to remove his profile picture from LinkedIn. And I found that extremely interesting. Eventually, he did get it back because obviously, this is Olav Laudi. I know this myself because I have worked with him. I've been in physical client meetings with him. So I know that the picture and, and, the, and the name point to the same entity. But how does LinkedIn know? And who is this we that acted upon an insight they believe to be true? I mean, this is basically a case of false positive where the algorithm at LinkedIn, for some reason, just decides, nope, this is not Olav, get this picture out, it's a violation of user policy. I found that super interesting. Another also very problematic area that relates to algocracy and, and ruled by algorithms is the, uh, the picture content management and how various service providers such as Google take the liberty of looking at your pictures and determining whether or not they are okay. And the intent in this case is, of course, super honorable, and you don't want 
pedophiles running around on the internet and sharing pictures and the whole thing. But people that are, uh, there, there is also a sort of problematic victim kind of situation that you can end up in. And in this case, this was an article in the New York Times just a couple of days ago, where this dad had taken a picture of his toddler's genitalia because he had some kind of rash or there was a problem. And then he sent them to the doctor online and Google immediately flagged this and they launched an investigation. And eventually the, the authorities were, the law enforce, enforcement authorities were called in. Google permanently deleted this guy's accounts and his Android phone, his email, the whole works just got canceled. But in this case, the authorities sort of cleared him. It was just a harmless you know, picture used in a specific uh, context for a specific purpose. Uh, and it was not sexually abusive in any way. But of course, the law enforcement investigator, Nicholas Hiller, couldn't reach Mark to discuss with him because his phone and his account details had just been deleted. And I thought that was quite interesting. And even more disturbing and interesting, I guess, was the fact that even though he was cleared, he could not get his accounts or content details, account details back. And the authorities couldn't do anything. So these, I think, are two quite interesting examples relating to what can go wrong when we automate decision processes. Um, there is another uh, challenge with, with, with the digital times that we live in today. And I think we saw this most starkly uh, during the insurrection at the Capitol. And in connection with this, uh, Facebook uh, observed that a lot of the times where when a uh, when a yeah that's better uh, a lot of the times when a, when a when a user joins an extremist group it does so based on a automated platform recommendation uh, what is this not working ah, okay sorry uh, yes, all right. Uh, Facebook also acknowledged that pages and groups associated with QAnon extremism had at least 3 million members, meaning Facebook helped radicalize 2 million people. So these 2 million people were basically radicalized and invited into these extremist groups based on algorithms. And we all know what happened a little later on January 6th, right? And Facebook also acknowledges that around 5% uh, of the more than 2 billion active Facebook accounts are probably fake. And this builds this massive momentum online, which then spills over into the physical world and has great implications for the actual sort of real meat space, if you will. Another way to think about how we live in a digital first time is to observe that 1.2 billion people in China share the same surname. And I found that interesting. And this is basically because not all Chinese characters have been coded into computer systems. So if you have a name that is not digitized, you can't use a lot of the services that society provides. So you have to sort of get one of these more common names and then you're sort of let into the digital community. Another thing, the final example that I would like to give of this notion of the digital first world is when I traveled to San Francisco a couple of years ago, I had bought this great looking Jimi Hendrix t-shirt. And when I came to customs, the automated uh, passport control couldn't scan my face. And so security came and I asked them, there seems to be a problem here. And the, the officer basically said, just cover the eyes of Jimmy and then the visual recognition mechanism in, in, the, in the passport control will understand what it's seeing. So I had to do that. And basically we are now in a position where we as humans, we need to assure our technology that we are in fact not robots. And I think that is very telling. So basically then, I think Terence McKenna put it very well when he said, the primary contribution of 20th century thinking is to have understood that information is primary. And he then, derived the idea that the world is basically made out of language and the implication for the digerati is that reality can therefore be hacked. And I think this is what we're seeing quite a bit of today. We talk about the fake news and the rest of it. So anyway, that's the larger 
situation I think we find ourselves in. And into that, we have artificial intelligence. And it's interesting to ask yourself what it is, what is artificial intelligence? And one way, one thing that it is, is hype. There's a lot of hype around AI and a set of technologies that get labeled into that box. And if you're familiar with this hype, the Gardner hype cycle curve, you know that there's usually some sort of innovation trigger, and then that triggers a, a buildup of momentum, and then there's hype, then there's disappointment, and then there's a more um, uh, uh, true sort of perception of what it can do. Uh, and I think the, in, the innovation trigger for AI very much was the, the paper that Turing, Alan Turing, uh, published uh, in the 50s, where he asked this question, can machines think? And I think that is a very interesting question to ask yourself. After that, the field basically took off. And now every now and then there's been a, an overinflation of hype, and then there's been a, a disappointment, and then there's been another sort of set of hypes, and then the more another set of disappointments. And we call these you know, AI winters, where everything is just not what it was thought it was going to be. Uh, but in the 70s, you had a guy like Dreyfus writing books like What Computers Can't Do, The Limits of Intelligence, Artificial Intelligence. And there was this sense that there is actually such a limit. But then more recently, we see books like these being written, which is sort of uh, flaming the fire of the hype, basically. And they are very open horizon uh, oriented. They're very sort of... Uh, willing to say that eventually things will get quite strange. But regardless, there is no consensus definition of what artificial intelligence is. Uh, and I think uh, this was amply shown by Pei Wang a couple of years back when he wrote this article on defining artificial intelligence. And he lays out the case for one definition, but it takes 25 pages to just try and get the definition in place. Um, so when it comes to artificial intelligence, then it is difficult to lock down and, and uh, define. And for that reason, I have for my own sake, defined it quite inclusively. I basically say artificial intelligence is intelligence without biology. You get biology out, you have, in, you, you have intelligence, then you're in the area of artificial intelligence. But this is, of course, super inclusive because basically I view the calculator as an artificially intelligent thing. Uh, and for instance, if I were to meet a person who could execute calculations on par with the calculator at the same speed, at the same complexity, I would intuitively view that person as intelligent in some regards. But Moving on then, what can artificial intelligence do? And I like to sort of call out four things that artificial intelligence can do. You can use AI to optimize something. You can use it to automate something or process. You can use it to amplify or augment a situation, a process, a product, something. And you can use it to recognize things. So these are the sort of four things that, that artificial intelligence is capable of doing. All of these four are problematic and challenging and needs to be uh, reflected upon. So if you think of uh, the fact that Sweden is now going to, 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 to have an election, there's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, amplification of messaging going on uh, on the internet, right? And there was this tweet from the Sverige Demokraterna and in Aftonbladet just the other day, there was an interesting article about how uh, technology is being used to automate amplification of these kinds of messages. There's a, there's a notion that uh, pattern recognition is great, but of course we saw what happened with the Cambridge Analytica uh, leak uh, the, some years ago, which was also super problematic. I mean, it's amazing that you, can, that you can recognize patterns and you can sort of parse large sets of data, but it's not necessarily a good thing. Also, if you think about optimization and, and social media, you can see that if you have a advertising-based model 
uh, you, you as a company, you will try to optimize revenue. And the way to do that, if you're advertising based, is to optimize on engagement. So whatever makes people hang out longer at these, on these social platforms, that's what they're going to push for. And thus you see you know, the, the radicalization of Facebook users. And I think there's a, there is a very strong connection between some of the challenges with artificial intelligence and the advertising-based revenue streams. And I don't know if you know William Burroughs, and it may be uh, somewhat harsh to uh, imply that uh, social media platforms are drug dealers. But I think he, William Burroughs made a very good point when he says that the junk merchant doesn't sell his product to the consumer, he sells the consumer to his product. And in, in many ways, we are the products that these social media platforms uh, monetize and capitalize on. So we are being sold to the advertising companies, basically. And then we see the problems of successfully automating things. Just because you can automate something doesn't mean that you will get it right. So you may have false positive problematics uh, rampant. Uh, and if you scale that, then you will have a, have a great problem. But if we take a step back then and we think, okay, so we now have a sort of idea of what artificial intelligence is, but we haven't really touched upon what intelligence is in itself. I think it is worthwhile uh, considering what Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart had to say uh, about obscenity. And there was, a famous, there was a famous court case in the US in the 60s, uh, an obscenity case. And this judge, this justice was, guy was forced to try and give a definition of hardcore pornography. And he said, well, I may not be able to actually give it a definition, but I know it when I see it. And I think this is sort of true of intelligence as well. We, 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 we don't really, we're not really able to lock down a definition of it, but we sort of tend to recognize it when we see it. And if we try to sort of gently um, describe it to some extent, I think there are four things that, that I at least would expect from something that I would label intelligent. One is I would want to have some element of understanding in place. And by understanding in this case, I mean some sort of contextual sensitivity. So you, you understand something in a larger context. So it's not just a rule execution. Four plus four is always, four plus four is always eight. Uh, but it's more complex than that. It's, it's context sensitive. Also, I sort of expect an element of reasoning to be put in play here. Uh, again, it's not about finding a single point of the truth, but it is the ability to reason and take a lot of complexities into consideration. I also want an element of learning to be in play. I want things to improve over time. Um, and I want interaction to be possible, regardless of it's whether, whether it's between two people or a person and a machine. If you have smooth interaction, you also have some sort of intelligence in play. And if you have all of these four, to me, that signals intelligence. I also find it interesting to think about how did intelligence evolve and what are the implications of, of how you understand that. And if we look at our closest relative in the, in the animal kingdom, the chimpanzees, we should, we, should, we should bear in mind that the chimpanzee, the chimp, is more similar to us then the chimpanzee is similar to the gorilla. And humans and chimps share 98% of their DNA, but the human brain is three times the size of the chimp's brain. So we're similar, but we're also quite dissimilar, obviously. And if you look at the, uh, the, the archeological record, you will see this thing. You will see that the human brain size exploded in size around 2 million years ago. And there were a long period of time when the human brain didn't really expand very much. And, and I'm sort of implying here that there's a relationship between brain size and intelligence, by the way. But anyway, there was a recent article uh, in Nature arguing for bipedalism being 
the trigger for what makes us human, basically. The, the thing is, though, they put that, that breakthrough event roughly 7 million years ago by looking at the, some of the bones that they have access to. Uh, so even if we started walking upright 7 million years ago, nothing much happened in terms of brain size for quite a long period of time, almost for 5 million years. Nothing happened, and then boom. There are other uh, arguments, uh, explanatory models uh, proposed uh, to, to account for the, the increase of human brain size. One is megafauna uh, decreasing. And this is basically when we see in the, in the fossil record that the very large animals basically start decreasing in number quite drastically. And so the argument is being made that because humans hunted these large animals and then had to shift over to hunting smaller animals that triggered or that that necessitated a greater amount of intelligence but again same thing here it happened basically started happening basically four million years ago apparently and for quite a long time that didn't really have an impact on the human brain size a third explanation that is being put forth at times is that the most rapid increase in human brain size uh, correlated with the period in, 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 in history where the climate fluctuated the most. So if you look back at the, over the, the most recent 10 million years, the period of, of greatest climate uh, fluctuation coincided with the brain size taking off. But that happened quite recently and the brain size was already, had already been increasing quite drastically. So I've always been sort of interested in what happened here. What was the spark? What made the human brain start increasing? And there is obviously then no single answer to that. I like the idea that, uh, that uh, Stanley Kubrick puts forth in his um, 2001 Space Odyssey movie, where he basically says, the moment the proto-hominids struck a relationship with technology, we, uh, we, uh, we divert, we, um, we uh, became something different than, than what we had been before. Uh, and of course, I mean, the, the innovation trigger, I guess, in this case would be the monolith coming from outer space. But regardless, I think the idea that at some point we, we strike up a relationship with technology tools uh, is an appealing one. Of course, chimps use tools too as does a bunch of other animals, but they don't quite use technology the same way humans do. We use technology in a drastically different way from than anybody, everybody else. And so I do think that technology in many ways is what makes us human. So how, how so? Well, I like to lean on Marshall McLuhan when it comes to thinking about this and he wrote a wonderful book called Understanding Media, the Extensions of Man. He wrote many interesting books, but in this book, he's basically making an argument which looks a little bit like this. He's saying technology, media, culture, language, art, artificial intelligence, tools, same. They're all the same. What they are not are ideas, feelings, intelligence, experience, imagination. But he also says these two domains, they have a relationship. The one gives the other. And so he spoke about man extending himself. And I think it's evident that this is so. I mean, we have extended our reach by putting, putting ourselves on the moon. We've left the, uh, our technology, our, our equipment uh, has left the solar system. We've landed uh, rovers on Mars. Elon Musk has sent his uh, roadster on, on the way to Mars as well. And all of this has happened very, very rapidly. So when Terence McKenna looks at this, he goes, one moment you're hunting ungulates on the plains of Africa, and the next moment you're hurling a gold terbium, terbium superconducting stellar device toward Alpha Centauri with all the mankind on board in virtual space being run as a simulation in circuitry. It's just first one thing and then the other thing. And I sort of, I can see, I can see the, 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 the validity of that. At the same time, we are not there yet. 
I mean, I don't know if you if you if you've been paying attention to all the flack that Zuckerberg justly has received for his metaverse drops, uh, but um, we are not in the future yet, uh, and there is an over inflation of of uh, um, hype around the metaverse of those kinds of ideas. And I, th I think if you if you pour ten billion worth of dollars into the metaverse and you come away with this picture you should receive universal mockery i think that is just uh, not very impressive but but i can see how how the the urge and the and the idea is there like it's inevitable we want to go there for some reason it's human but the the technology today may not be you know indistinguishable from uh, humans, but it is certainly human to some extent. And Ludwig von Bartalanffy made a very interesting observation, I thought, in his book, uh, General Systems Theory, where he uh, observed that people are not machines, but in all situations where they are given the opportunity, they will act like machines. So he's basically, he's basically making the case that humans are creatures of habit, and habit may be a way for the brain to automate certain things to, to energize, to, to optimize energy consumption. We just walk the same way we always do to work. We brush our teeth the same way. There are all these things that we just, we just habitually do, like on autopilot. But I made an, an, I've made another observation, which is sort of inversely true of that. And that is that machines are not people. But in all situations where they are given the opportunity, they will act like people. And that, I think, is very interesting. And I think about this not so much in, 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 the, in the aspect of humanoid robotics. I mean, I certainly think that the Boston, the Boston Dynamic guys are doing some very fascinating stuff. Uh, but I'm more thinking about it in terms of intelligence. And I'm thinking about how technology over the over the years have become more and more capable of doing things that we at some point felt was the, uh, uh, the, the, the privilege of humans. So in the mid 90s or up until the mid 90s, humans were much better at playing chess, for instance, than the machines. And then IBM with Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov and it was amazing, but it didn't of course stop there. That was just the trigger. And then 2011, uh, the technology had advanced to such an extent that it could beat uh, the greatest humans playing Jeopardy, which was, of course, also a tremendous achievement in terms of technology capability. Uh, I thought that what, um, what Google did with, with AlphaGo playing Go was also amazing. Uh, and it, it, and it, it's certainly much more complex than, than chess, but it was an amazing achievement. And what they also did was not only did they, did they have an expert system train and, and outperforming humans, they could then also show that they could teach the, the AI to, to teach itself to play goal without any previous experience, just by playing the game. So without the history, without the expertise, without relying on any tutor or, or master, it just Here's the rule book, learn how to do it better than anybody else. And then boom, they did that. OpenAI also showed that you could have algorithms collabor collaborate together and they played uh, Dota 2, which is basically five players teaming up and beating or trying to beat another team of five people. And they showed that they could get five algorithms to work together and optimize the greater, uh, the greater objective rather than sub-optimizing per individual algorithm or player. I thought that was very interesting because collaboration has always been something that we feel is very human. Uh, a few years ago, Google made that duplex announcement and they were, they were calling up the hairdressers and they were making uh, the ordered pizzas. And the speech technology was tremendously impressive and it really sounded indistinguishable from from uh, humans, some of those uh, examples that they gave. IBM continued, you know, forging into the, the area of, of natural language understanding, and they stood up this project debater, 
which is basically a neural network capable of debating on certain topics that it's been trained on. And what I find fascinating with this is that a debate is not uh, about being right. It is about being persuasive. It's about seducing people to adopt your point of view. And uh, for the debate, it can do that successfully. And it can also do it jointly. This is a picture, I think, from the Debate Society at uh, Cambridge. And that is also something that is, in many respects, sort of human. Of course, we also saw GPT-3 uh, and what has happened in terms of language generation. And now uh, we're sort of in the, in the era, if you will, of, uh, of having text being converted into images. And these DALI-2 uh, models, MidJourney and the rest of them are amazing. I mean, I find it amazing that you can just tell a, tell a technology to, um, yeah, I want to see an astronaut riding a horse in a photorealistic style. Boom, no problem. Or what about teddy bears working on new AI research on the moon in the 1980s? Boom. Amazing, right? So we are seeing uh, the evolution of our technology in the direction of uh, incorporating and, and um, being able to execute human-like uh, things. Um, so when our technology and, uh, becomes more and more human-like, there is also uh, with that a set of new challenges that wasn't perhaps challenges before, but they become problematic as our technology adopt human features. And I think Nietzsche put it very well when he said that the thing with humans is that we are all too human. And by that, I guess he meant that we are flawed. We are not perfect. We're not gods. Uh, we have a, we have a, a limit on, on, on life. Uh, we will only live for so long. Uh, and there are a bunch of things that, that, that result out of this. One is, you know, how we say uh, uh, the human error or the human factor as an, explan as an explanation for when things go wrong uh, at times. And you can think about this in terms of traffic. Uh, as we're seeing the, uh, the, the, the area of autonomous driving taking off, we will, of course, see situations that are horrific. And we will see the same kinds of uh, situations happening uh, in fully autonomous mode as we will see in fully uh, non-autonomous mode. Uh, so that when, 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 um, when we move into this area, it becomes extremely uh, important to, to think about responsibility, grief recovery. Like if, if, if somebody you love will be killed in a car accident, uh, if, if, if a person is driving a car, it's potentially so that you can you can work with that person in, in a grief recovery mode. But if the algorithm killed off grandma, you know, it's difficult for you to, to reconciliate your head around that, I guess. We will also see that uh, a lot of these biases that, that are rampant in humans will also move into the, into the technology domain. And out of that will come all these completely crazy things that are just unfortunate and, and they need to be addressed. For instance, if you have credit card scoring that, that score people differently based on gender, or if, or if you score people differently and you can't understand why, there's certainly a problem. Or if you have racist-like results by, uh, by uh, automating or leveraging new technology, that's also a, a tremendous problem. It's also a tremendous problem in the sense that as the technology become more human-like, we can do things that may seem like a good idea, but that may be problematic either directly or indirectly or down the road. So we may sort of inadvertently enforce biases or views that we shouldn't see more of. Rather, we should, we should work 
in a different way. We shouldn't have all the call centers sound like uh, American white males because we think that that's a greater chance for a successful call. We should work on viewing uh, different dialects and ways of speaking as equal, as long as there, there's a good uh, uh, communication uh, being established. All right. Another problem, so, so one of the problems then with, with artificial intelligence that we need to be aware of is this element of, of the human-like uh, uh, side of things. Another thing that we also need to be aware of is the energy cost of intelligence. And you can maybe you recall the, the Matrix movie, and there was this, this idea of the machines using the humans as batteries to, to power their, their existence somehow. Um, but the, it is certainly so that the human being is an energy system. And, and on average, roughly, a human being's daily calorie intake is about 2,000 calories, of which roughly 20% is consumed by the brain. Now, this is equivalent of roughly 2.4 kilowatt hours, or the same as running a light bulb, 100 watt light bulb for 24 hours. And with that amount of energy or power, you can power minds such as Einstein and Da Vinci. Give them 2,000 calories, boom. You have an enormous amount of, of intelligence uh, uh, to leverage, potentially. If you compare this then to the energy cost of teaching a robotic arm to solve the Rubik's cube, you will see that this is not perhaps viable because that required probably three gigawatt hours of electricity, which basically is the equivalent of running the Swedish nuclear facility in Forsmark at full throttle for one hour. It basically turns out three gigawatt hours. So that doesn't work, right? And also the communication technologies, electricity usage could contribute up to 23% of globally released greenhouse gas emissions in 2030. So even if we don't all you know, mine bitcoins, simply running this presentation this way puts pressure on the climate. And as uh, my former colleague, John Kuhn said, if rapid progress in AI is to continue, we need to reduce its environmental impact. And we're seeing this, of course, all the, all the, all the tech giants and all the, the, the tech uh, heavy uh, organizations, companies are working in this area. And you see Microsoft trying to be carbon negative by 2030. Google is trying to figure out how to, be, how to run data centers more energy efficiently uh, and so on. But so trying then to bring this all together and sort of wrap it up a little bit, uh, I would like to uh, present you the notion of the forward escape. Uh, and to set the scene a little bit, I think if you think about artificial intelligence in this way that I've tried to outline today as something that is sort of inevitable and also very human, and something that has great potential, but also great, uh, it comes with great challenges. I can, you can sort of see how, how people will view technology as perhaps a bit frightening. And I mean, of course, if you have Stephen Hawking, Bill Gates or Elon Musk or the rest of them talking about artificial intelligence as the, as the greatest existential threat, I mean, I guess you should listen a little bit, but I think that that is a, this is an unfortunate uh, uh, misconception at its core. And I think a much better way to think about it is how Elon Musk uh, uh, spoke about it uh, when he visited Joe Rogan some time ago. And Joe Rogan was basically asking him, you know, oh, but if we get like an artificially general intelligence in place, you know, it's going to be is it going to be bad? Is it going to be evil? And Elon Musk goes, it's not necessarily bad. It's just outside of human control. And I thought that was a very clever and, and valid way of thinking about it. And I think why it is important to me to sort of talk to you and, 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 and conduct these kinds of presentations is because I think we need to find a way of controlling our technology, but we can't control it 
just by you know outsourcing regulations. We need to understand it. We need to control it through an act of understanding. And so therefore, I think it is worthwhile to think about uh, uh, what it means to be intelligent in opposition to what it means to be stupid. And so there was an there was a interesting essay written in the 70s by this Berkeley uh, professor, Carlo uh, Cipolla, and he outlined the basic laws of human stupidity. And I was sort of round off with this. Uh, and he put up this box in the square and he said, if you think about behavior, you can think about behavior that is good for you, good for others, and bad for you and bad for others. And he then defined intelligent people as those people that act in a way which is beneficial for themselves and beneficial for others. So if you do that, then in Chipola's model, you're intelligent. The opposite is, of course, if you behave in a way that is bad for yourself and bad for others, you're stupid. And then there are, of course, the bandits who then act in a way that is good for, for themselves, but bad for everybody else. And then you sort of have the helpless people, as Chipola calls them, who act in a way that is good for other people, but not for themselves. And of course, this is just a model. I mean, nobody is just in one box. But I think this is a very uh, worthwhile way of looking at it. And he then outlined five laws of human stupidity. And I will just run through them very quickly, uh, because I, I think it's very important to, to consider this. One is, always, and this is according to Chipola then, Always and inevitably, everyone underestimates the number of stupid individuals in circulation. So there are more stupid people than you can possibly imagine. Two, the probability that a certain person will be stupid is independent of any other characteristic of that person. So you can sort of, if you look at it through um, a lens of gender or age or uh, food taste or length, height or whatever, nothing will have any bearing. It's just its own. Three, a stupid person then is a person who causes losses to another person or to a group of persons while himself deriving no gain or and even possibly incurring losses. Non-stupid people always underestimate the damaging power of stupid individuals. In particular, non-stupid people constantly forget that at all times and places, under any circumstances, to deal and or associate with stupid people always turns out to be a costly mistake. And then finally, and this I think is the, 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 the important message here, a stupid person is the most dangerous type of person. So we need to find a way to move people and technology out of the stupidity box and up into the intelligence box. And the only way to do that, as I see it, is through education. And that's why I think the machine learning course or, or an applied AI course or what have you, anything that makes you more intelligent about these things is a good idea and a good, good, good thing to focus on. And H.G. Wells, the, the sci-fi writer, he said uh, Human history becomes more and more erased between education and catastrophe. And I think that is spot on. And I think we can see this uh, you know, in, many, in, in many ways if, you, if we look around us in society today. Uh, and then finally, I certainly side with, with Terence McKenna that it is intelligence that we have to have to make the forward escape into hyperspace. If we want to have a future, if we want to have an exciting adventure into the future greater unknown, we have to have intelligence. Otherwise, we're going to burn the planet, burn ourselves, and just act in a way that is not sustainable at all. And we need sustainability because we need more time. The metaverse is not around the corner, but, but, it, but, but the promise of it is around somewhere. And we need to sort of find ways to, 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 uh, to tread gently and have everybody with us uh, when we make that journey. So um, that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, very inspiring lecture here on the sort of the world of AI. Um, I remind everybody again that you can ask questions using menti.com to go in on the, this and you enter this code 8339 0834, and then you can uh, write your questions there. 
while uh, we gather up some, some questions, uh, I was just going to mention one thing from us here at Mid Sweden University, and that's it is that we actually have uh, a course on uh, applied machine learning, where, where this open lecture is actually the, like the first lecture in this course as well. And we have been running this course for quite a few years now, but we have for this year actually updated it quite a lot. We have updated the course content, materials and lectures, and we're actually focusing even more on practical work. Uh, getting this uh, to be your, like your first dip into the world of AI machine learning and learning how to actually program these type of things. Um, this whole uh, course is sort of made also for working professionals. So if you are a person working right now, maybe with AI, maybe machine learning, maybe not, but just want to learn more, this is definitely a course you can take because it's made to be done in, in with, uh, with a slow pace, very flexible format. We have these live streamed uh, lectures and stuff like that. You can watch them when you want to and stuff like that. Uh, it awards 3 HP at an advanced level. And of course it's free of charge for, for, um, for everyone in Sweden. Uh, and uh, it's actually open for, for late enrollment. So, and the next sort of actual lecture in the course is on Tuesday in two weeks. So, so there's still time to apply. So if you want to apply, you can go into either our webpage or you find this course on ontogny.se where you can find it. And basically the entry requirements is that you already have a, a bachelor degree in computer engineering, electrical engineering or something uh, similar. And you also need to have some basic uh, programming skills. And uh, with that, I think we go over to, to the questions. And again, please write your questions if you have anything, and I will take them up with Patrick. Uh, so the first one, I think, uh, question that we got was uh, quite a lot what you talked about here in the end. is about uh, the dystopian <laughs> approach to AI. And the question is, uh, why are co consumers and media so afraid of AI, typically portraying it as dystopian? Also, where do you think will hit a w uh, hit a wall in regards to long term continued development of AI? Okay, so um, yeah, I guess maybe two um, two aspects to that question. Uh, in terms of why people are are uh, veering towards dystopia, I think it is because um, it's just human nature to fear the unknown uh, and things that we don't understand are unknown to us or and so therefore we tend to sort of project onto the the blank canvas of the unknown something that is fear based i think when you see this being politically uh played out in in how the the political parties in sweden are up, running up to the election are talking about um you know we need to have increased the funding for for the, for the military we need uh, more uh, surveillance cameras and uh is, is basically a, a fear mongering uh, approach. And I think it plays on the human psychology. So I think it is, it's just human nature to, to fear what we don't understand and grasp. And, and then, we, um, then we get concerned. And of course, just as um, social media platforms optimize uh, on engagement, engagement is, tends to be you know stronger when there is a, a shock or a, or a, or, a, or a fear or a, or a, some some negative element there i mean just think of how you tend to sort of slow down if if you see a police car having pulled over another car at uh, on the freeway or something i mean it's just a human nature thing i think in terms of hitting hitting a wall or or uh, getting further disappointments uh, uh, in terms of technology development. I do think that it has a lot to do with uh, the energy cost. I don't think that we can uh, create all the things that we, I don't think we can, we can uh, manifest all the, all the theoretical capabilities that we can see. I think we, like we can't give everybody an autonomous, driving Tesla we don't we can't have 10 billion of those uh, so there will be there has to be uh, a breakthrough in, in in the way we compute basically and maybe quantum computing down the road can can perhaps be that kind of paradigm shift that will get us out of the out of the, uh, the fix we're in but I do think that it is the, the energy the the demand the climate the, the demand on the planet that is just 
putting the limits to what we can do in terms of applied AI. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I'm going to continue with a, maybe a question for myself or from, from my um, domain as a researcher, and it's perhaps quite a lot connected to your bias and stuff like that. Is how do you see like this, uh, this um, uh, the idea of, of all the data, right? Because it, many of these machine learning things is like, you have, if you have good data, you can re get really good results. But if you have very poor data that might be biased and you might get very uh, poor results, uh, do you think that we need to work a lot more with getting the right data as well, or? Well, yeah. So there, there is for for many years now. There's it's been fashionable to talk about data as the new gold or the new oil or you know the the, the resource that we never run out of and all of that stuff. Uh, at the same time, I really don't. I mean, yes, there's there are certainly tremendous problems with data sets being skewed and 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 especially. Um, data sets being sort of dr drifting over time and, and causing uh, uh, the execution of, of models uh, to, to sort of deteriorate as well. But I don't really think that is fixed by looking at the data itself. I think it's a, it is more of a uh, modeling challenge and, a, and an approach challenge. I don't think everything can be fixed with just get the data right and then you know we'll be fine because that's not how the world works the world is more complex than you can map out in a data set and therefore we need to find different approaches to 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 um, offsetting all these uh, dumb things that are happening when people aren't thinking and just uh, applying or or deploying uh, ai models i guess yeah all right thanks uh, so what do you think uh, is the biggest risk that AI presents to for consumers and citizens? Privacy. Many frameworks for ethical AI exist. What value do these provide? Yes, very interesting uh, topic. The whole AI ethics domain is super uh, important and should be pursued. Uh, at the same time, ethics hasn't been... Uh, worked out uh, non-technologically so far yet, even though we've been at it for a thousand years or 2000 years, I don't know, for a long time. And it is a challenge. And the basic problem is there is nothing to, 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 um, to hinge uh, the, 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 the definition of good or bad on. There's no universal bedrock that you can rely on. So you have to get people on board to have a conversation about how we want to have things run and people are quite different and they, they, they want to have things differently. And so I can only say that probably the greatest chance we have to, to get things in a good shape is to make sure that as many people as possible are included in the conversation. Um, like, you know, it's, you know how people are complaining about the UN and how it's inefficient and regardless of what people want, eventually somebody in the Security Council will veto it and nothing will happen. And, but at the same time, what else, how else can we set it up? We need to have the conversation. We need to lead by example and show what are the, the, the good ways of, of, uh, of handling things. But concretely in terms of integrity and, and privacy, I think that is a, there is a tremendous challenge there. Uh, I think that there is a private sphere that should not be violated. And just because some people's private spheres are quite unwholesome, that doesn't mean that we can invade them and feel that we did the right thing because we exposed it. I think it's, it's challenging. Um, and technology makes transparency very, very uh, possible. Uh, so I can see that you, I can see that Google and Apple and all the all the all the great uh, data managing companies want to look into that data and look at the pictures that you take and, and and sort of have views on whether or not that's okay or not. But I just see it as super problematic. I don't know if it's an answer. I feel I'm evading the question, but I, I just find it so very difficult. Yeah. No, but it's it worthwhile to really, to really, you know, work on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, uh, a third question here is back to, to Elon's quote in the, in the end. Uh -huh. So Elon said that it would be outside of human control. Uh, is it so? Or are there any regulation actions being made by governments and companies? Uh, to well, I think in that, that, spe in that specific context, the, the, the question was about the artificial general intelligence. So the idea was that, okay, if we, if we were to think about a scenario where we actually truly have something that is as intelligent as we are, however we define it, what does that mean? And then I think Elon is right. I think then there will be, it will be sort of unintelligible to us. We will not be able to understand it uh, unless it, it sort of wants to. But just, ha just, just having me say this sounds a bit off because I think of it more as uh, one of the truth, one of the things that are sort of uniquely or truly human is this sort of imaginative, creative spark, if you will. Um, and that's why the arts and artists and art is so fascinating. And that I think is why also these um, language to images um, capabilities that are being stood up now are so fascinating. But I really think that uh, the idea is that a lot of the surprises uh, or, or lack of control results from uh, a, 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 lack of, um, a lack of understanding. Uh, so for instance, in that, in that example of the Goa game, there was this one move that uh, the alpha go algorithm made which surprised everybody and everybody was like whoa what's that nobody has ever played that kind of move before it must be you know ooh. and i think that's just because we are sort of we, we tend to think about things in, in in specific ways because of our heritage our, our history our culture what have you and if, if we free up a different approach we will be surprised by what will happen and then we, we will feel that we won't be able to control it because we won't understand it. So we, I mean, today we have to have, you know, AI assisted uh, understanding to understand AI, I guess. Yeah. All right. So uh, I think our final question then is quite much connected to this. I think it's about self-awareness uh, and towards general AI, I guess. So uh, the, the question is, I actually start to think that self-awareness is essential for intelligence and that self-awareness has uh, been evolving gradually through biological evolution. What do you think? Yes, I think uh, it's a fascinating area, uh, awareness, consciousness, uh, sentience, mm. uh, and, and that is absolutely something that, is, that, is, that defines life. Like if, if you were to talk about something being alive, you, you, you are sort of, I guess, asking for some sort of self-awareness, even if you're a bacteria or what have you. I mean, there's, there's something there. Um, I don't know. I, I can tell you that same as with uh, some of these other terms, consciousness and self-awareness has not been uh, defined in, in, a, in a consensus kind of way. And there is no, nobody today would claim to have solved the mind body problem, if you will, the hard problem. Like how do these two relate? Do they relate? We sort of expect them to relate because if we say no uh, consciousness and self-awareness is immaterial and has no true connection to, to 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 matter then we're sort of implying some kind of you know religious or or sort of at the same time it seems reductionist to say well you know we just fiddle about with some parameters and boom off we have life mm -hmm. so um Again, I think uh, check out uh, human mind, uh, uh, writings on human mind relations and, and the concept of consciousness. I think that field is super interesting. All right. So again, thank you very much, Patrick, for this very inspiring lecture. It's always fun <laughs> to, to have, it, have you here with us. Thank so uh, I'm gonna just gonna end by uh, again, uh, talking a little bit about the course. Like I said, this is the first lecture in this course that we're giving on applied machine learning. And uh, in that course, again, we will just cover the basics of uh, Keras TensorFlow on how to program these very typical things. And we will talk about how to frame 
uh, machine learning problems to get get them to do what we want. It's a very much an introductionary course to the area uh, to for you then to learn more later. But it's uh, it's definitely touching upon this this whole ho whole area, even though you're just sort of applying the first steps of it. And like I said, it's open for late enrollment. You can just go in and apply right now and get access to all the content. And then we, we start up um, in two weeks with all the other lectures. And it's self-paced and it's flexible, so you can actually take it in the time that you want and stuff like that. All right, and with that, I uh, thank you everyone for, for listening. And, um, and thank you again, Patrick. <laughs>